today I want to talk to you a little bit about the business structure of theater. This is something I get asked a great deal about, so I want to sort of clarify this. I mentioned a little bit of this to you in Drama 1 last year, so some of this may sound familiar. Um, but we're going to go into it in more depth today. So in terms of types of theaters, the thing that makes this complicated is that theater is one of the few things in the world that is both a business and a hobby. It is both a vocation, which, by which we mean a job, as well as what we call an avocation, which means a hobby. Um, so there are professional theaters, where as a professional you get paid and that sort of stuff. But there's also what we call community theaters, where people go just because they want to do a show. You don't see this in any other industry that I'm aware of. People say that they love money. But no one I can think of goes and, and like works eight hours a day as a mechanic and then goes to like a bank and is a bank teller for six hours a night just because they love money so much. Uh, we don't have community banks. We don't have like community surgeries where this guy is like a lawyer for eight hours and then he really wants to help people. So I'm going to go over here and be a surgeon for four hours in the evening. That does not happen. But you do have community theaters where someone is a lawyer or a teacher or a videographer for eight hours a day. And then they go in the evenings and to do a show. And they're in rehearsal for four to six hours or they're in a show in the evening. And they do it not because it's a paying gig but because they just love doing it. So that's what community theater is. Um, and it's kind of amazing that theater should be that appealing to people, that it can be both compelling to people as a job, but it's still compelling enough to people that they want to do it even if they're not getting paid for it, just for the joy of doing a show. So that what, that's what makes it a little bit unusual. Um, so as we look at different theater types, we'll be looking both at the idea of professional theater, which is defined as where you get paid, which I think is a, a nice thing, you know, um, versus what we call community theater, which you do because it's fun. And that's wonderful. I would highly recommend. There's some great community theaters in this area. Uh, it's a great way to get started. It's a great way to do shows that they're not doing otherwise. I still will do community shows um, once in a while if they're doing something that's really wonderful that I might not get a chance to do um, at another one. So we're going to look at multiple theater types. We're going to go from big to small. And we're going to start in a city like Raleigh, Durham. We're not going to think about New York for a moment, because New York is its own crazy animal, and we're going to see that in a second. So typically, we, uh, we grade theaters by their size. The big theaters we call regional theaters. Um, and the biggest regional theaters we call Lort theaters, which stands for League of Resident Theaters. Um, and or we sometimes say League of Regional Theaters, although the technical definition is League of Resident Theaters. Um, <clears throat> so these are big theaters, often between 500 and 2,000 seats. Um, and there's usually one of them in a given region. So a state may have one or two Lort theaters. They're big, they're professional, by which we mean money. They tend to do very high quality performances. Um, and um, they, they tend to be the dominant theater in a given area. We have one Lort theater in this triangle area. Anyone know what that theater is? Yeah. Deepak? Uh, no, Deepak is a touring house. We'll talk about that in a second. That's, that's its own very special animal. Yeah. Uh, no, no. It's, uh, it's called Playmakers. And Playmakers is in Chapel Hill. It is a 500-seat thrust theater, but they are a Lort theater, so very professional. Um, they pay well, have great design stuff there. Um, so that is sort of your, your big tier professional theater. Um, and we're looking anywhere from 500 to, they can go 2,000 plus seats. Um, and they're ranked by letter. A Lort A house is more than two, is 2,000 or more seats. Lort B is, I believe, 1,000 to 2,000. Lort C is 500 to 1,000. So Playmakers, I believe, is a Lort C. And then Lort D is smaller than that, I think 100 to 500. But they're all members of the League of Resident Theaters, very, very sort of top level. They pay very, very well. Underneath this, you have the small professional theaters. <clears throat> uh, 
small professional theaters, again, they're professional because they pay, but they're going to pay you less. Um, and we'll talk about sort of how that is figured. Um, there's a lot of small pro theaters in this area. Um, things that you know, yeah. Coal. Absolutely, the one that Zach is at right now, Burning Coal, uh, which is Raleigh's small professional theater. We do a lot with them because I was their resident playwright for eight years, so I have ties with them, so we, we can bring them in here a lot, and we go there a lot, and that sort of thing. What else? So that's a community theater, although it's a community theater with a gigantic budget. We'll talk about that in just a moment. What else? Man Bites Dog in Durham, the very highly uh, um, regarded. They do brilliant work there. And there's another one called Deep Dish in Chapel Hill. Um, and these range inside. Uh, burning Coal is typically 150 seats. Man Bites, uh, they can get to 175 if they do it in the round, yes. Um, Man Bites typically is about 100. Deep Dish is about 75. Um, but they're professional theaters. And the, the thing to keep in mind is that all of these theaters produce their own work. This is a big deal uh, because of what we're going to be talking about in just a second. That each of these people hire directors, hire designers, hire actors, produce their own stuff. They are what we call producing companies. Um, now, tear down from here, what we call the community theaters. Um, a community theater, the thing that defines it, because you can, do some, you can get some great work at a community theater, uh, but the point is that the actors are not paid. That's what defines it as community theater. Um, and typically, the focus at a community theater is on providing a positive experience for everyone in the cast as well as the audience. Whereas with a professional theater, there's less concern, shall we say, that the actors are having a good time because this is a job. We're paying them. That's their good time is their paycheck. Um, so there's a lot more focus in a professional company, or certainly in a Lort theater, at making the best possible show. Where in a community theater, a lot of the focus is to make the best possible experience for both the actors as well as the, um, the audience. Um, and community theaters can be very, very good. Um, one of the largest community theaters in the nation is here in the Triangle, and that is Raleigh Little Theater. Raleigh Little Theater produces a dozen shows a year. They have a yearly operating budget of well over a million dollars. They have a beautiful space, actually has three theaters in it. Um, a 200-seat proscenium house, plus a 100 uh, 100 and some, I think maybe 115, 120 um, black box theater that is flexible, the, the Gaddy Theater. Um, so <clears throat> they're a major operation, but they're a community theater because that, that is their goal, is to engage the community in the making of theater rather than hiring actors to create theater. So that's what sort of separates them out there. But they tend to do some really great stuff, and they're a big organization. They hire professional designers. They have you know, really great production design, great sets, great costumes, um, some re and, and they've been around for 75 years. And they ha hang on to pretty much all their costumes and their sets. Um, so uh, if you ever need something, you can usually go to, to Raleigh Little Theater, and they will often let you rent it out pretty cheaply, because their goal is to support the artistic community. And they have everything. I needed for a show I was doing a wrought iron wheelchair from the 1920s. And I called up and saying, this is a really crazy thing. It's like, I need a wrought iron wheelchair. And they said, do you want it with a wicker back or a cloth back? We've got two of them. It's like, you're wonderful. <laughs> um, and I paid them like $20. And they gave me, and it weighs like a ton, because it's made of wrought iron. It's wonderful. Anyway, um, so that's community theater. Now, there's another entirely different thing. So all of these things are what we might call producing houses. Um, they produce their own stuff. However, there are a lot of theaters that producing is not what they do. They merely take shows that have been produced elsewhere, specifically in this big city we call New York. New York is where a lot of theater originates. And so we have a separate tier of theater types, specifically dealing with New York. 
The big ones, what we would call a Lort theater anywhere else, becomes a Broadway theater. We call them a Broadway theater. <clears throat> there is a street called Broadway in New York. Broadway theaters have nothing to do with this street. You can be a theater on Broadway. You, that does not make you a Broadway theater. Ma being a Broadway theater means that you have at least 1,000 seats. If you have 1,000 or more seats and you're in New York, you are a Broadway theater. Even if you're like over at Lincoln Center, um, if you're the Vivian Beaumont, which is a thousand seat uh, theater over at Lincoln Center, miles and miles from Broadway, it's still a Broadway theater because it's based on size. Um, smaller theaters that are professional theaters in New York we call off-Broadway. And they tend to be 500 to 1,000 seats or 999 if you want to be really pedantic about it. And if you're smaller than 500, we call you off, off Broadway, which typically is your 100 to 499, basically. Um, and yes, if you want to go, you could even go off, off, off Broadway, which is a technical term for a professional theater in a less than 100 seats um, in New York, such as that miserable nightmare production of Hamlet, the Tragedy of Prince of Denmark, which I scared you all with some time ago. So um, give me one second. I'll, I'll hold on to questions. Please do not forget them, because I want to do a big question and answer in the end. But I do want to lay this out. <clears throat> so these are New York theaters. Um, and very frequently, a show will get produced in New York at a big Broadway house. Um, and it will be produced by one of the big producing agencies like Livent or the Nederlanders or the Schuberts. Um, and that show, let's call it, I don't know, Wicked. That show will be really su successful and will run for years in New York. And then they'll say, you know what? Not everyone can get to New York to give us their money. And I bet people would like to give us money for this. So why don't we take it someplace else? And it's the same exact production. Same choreography, same direction, same design, same sets and costumes. They've just packed it up, or a, an exact replica of it, because Wicked is, um, whatever our show is, could still be running on Broadway when the first tour goes out. Um, so the tour is an exact replica that we've just put into a truck. Here we are on wheels. Here's the cab. That's better than I thought. Um, so the show goes right in there, boop, and then it drives around. And it comes to what we call a bus and truck house or a touring house. And it pops that show out. And they do it there for anywhere from two to six weeks. And then they go on to the next city on their tour. So when you see a touring show, um, like for example, to use a real one that you've Probably some of you have just seen Book of Mormon is a perfect example. Book of Mormon is still playing um, in New York, but an exact replica of it with the exact same staging, the same sets, all of that got packed up into trucks and trucked around the nation. One of the first places it went is Deepak, the Durham Performing Arts Center. Deepak is one of the largest touring houses in the nation. So it's called a first run house. So it means that tours make that a first stop um, and they will usually tour there the first year. I grew up in Salt Lake City. The touring house we had there, the Capitol Theater, was really nice. It had been re renovated and all that. It was like a third run house. So usually a show had to have done an entire Broadway run and then not even been running for like three years before the first tour came out to Salt Lake, um, which made me angry because I wanted to see shows um, like Miss Saigon or like Rent and that sort of thing that I never got to see on their, on their initial tours. So Deepak is a touring house. They do not produce their own stuff. There is no producer with a pile of cash sitting behind a desk at Deepak thinking, you know what, we should do Annie, let's do that. Um, that doesn't happen. All they do is they bring in existing shows and they mount them and they provide a space for these touring shows from New York or from other places. Tours do occasionally originate other places, rarely. Um, the other big one is the Memorial Auditorium in Raleigh. Um, and that's at the Progress Energy Center for the Performing Arts um, in Raleigh. And that used to be the big touring house. That's where all of 
the Broadway tours would come until they built DPAC, and then suddenly Memorial Auditorium is like, um, okay, we need to bring in shows. They tend to do very strange shows there. Um, but they are a touring house. So this is an important distinction. This is a distinction I did not recognize until I was in college, because I was stupid and I lived in Salt Lake, that when you see a show, if it's a tour, it's an exact duplicate, down to the sets, all that, the staging, where a given character moves in a scene that you would see on Broadway. Once a tour is over, once the producers on Broadway think, you know what, we can't make any more money off of this show, then they do something called releasing the rights. Because until that point, they own the rights. No one else can do that show. No one can do Book of Mormon until the producing agency, which I believe is the Schubert Theaters, decides to release the rights, that they've made enough money off of the tours that they will release the rights, and then places like Playmakers or Burning Coal or Man Bites Dog might decide that they were going to do their own production of Book of Mormon. Um, and they would make a set design for it and do all those sort of things that we've talked about already. But you can't do that until the rights have been released. Um, and sometimes the rights get released very soon. Sometimes the show will run on Broadway for a year, then close, and then the rights get released. Others, the show may run on Broadway, and then 10 years later, the rights may still not be released because the owners are looking into maybe doing a movie deal, um, in which case they want to hold on to those rights and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but in those cases, once the rights are released, then these producing houses would have the chance to make their own design, to come up with their own staging which is going to be different from the thing that we saw packaged in the truck and brought to us direct from New York. Um, yeah, because yeah, Shakespeare is in what we call um, uh, the public domain. No, no one owns the rights on it. So yes, you can do whatever you like with Shakespeare, um, which I'm sure makes Shakespeare really happy. So these are the different sort of types of theaters that exist in the world and exist in this area. And starting tomorrow, you're going to do some research on some of these, and you're going to present on some specific theaters um, and their aesthetic and what makes them important and that kind of thing. Um, but what I want to talk to you a little bit about now is this business of, OK, let's say I want to maybe someday be an actor in a Broadway house or maybe make a living some other way in theater. How would I go about doing that? To understand that, you need to understand something called equity. Um, the technical name is actor's equity, which is the union for stage actors. Um, it is the sister union of SAG, which is, called, which is the Screen Actors Guild. And by and large, if you are in a Hollywood movie, if you're getting paid to be on film, you must be in the Screen Actors Guild. Um, and if you're in one, you can automatically sign up to be in the other. And it is sometimes a little bit tricky to get into the union. Um, here's what the union does. One, it guarantees a certain minimum rate of pay. Um, the amount of money you make per week is dictated by how big or small the theater is. Um, but if you're in the union, they say there's a minimum amount you will get paid, even in this size theater. It also allows you to attend certain equity-only auditions for big places like you know, Broadway and big off-Broadway um, uh, theaters. That, and you cannot get into those auditions unless you are a member of equity. Um, sometimes even a, uh, a regional or a Lort house will go up to New York and do equity-only auditions because equity uh, actors tend to be the very best professional actors. Here's the catch. Here's what makes this interesting. If I am a producer sitting on my pile of money, um, I want to part with as little of that money as possible while still making the best possible show. So if I'm Broadway, I know to make this really world-class thing, I'm really going to only hire equity actors. But if I'm a Lort Theater in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or if I'm a small professional company, I might think, you know what? I could probably get actors who aren't equity, who are just about as good, um, and be able to pay them considerably less than the equity amount. And therefore, um, being in actors' equity is often very useful if you're in New York, because it opens up doors and certain types of auditions and prepares the way to get certain jobs that you wouldn't get otherwise. 
If you are someplace else, it can be a mixed blessing. Because yes, you do get paid a certain base amount that is more than you get paid if you weren't in actor's equity, but a producer may frequently choose to hire someone else uh, rather than go with the equity actor because they may have a limited number of equity contracts that they're able to do. Typically, for a small professional company, they may have the budget for one or two equity contracts per show. Um, but if they've used those up hiring the leads and you're auditioning for a supporting part and your equity, they may not have it in the budget to hire you. Uh, a Lort Theater may have more. They may have five or six contracts, which may be the entirety of the show. Um, but there's always sort of that trade-off of how valuable is it to be in equity. Um, the nice thing is it does, it gives you um, um, health insurance, which is always something that um, old people like myself care about. Um, and it also guarantees a, a, an amount. So this is the question that I get asked incessantly. Every time I talk anywhere about the business of, of, of being theaters, like, how much money do you make? Typically, not much. Um, you cannot go into the theater hoping to become rich. The problem is there are these outliers who are able to make vast amounts of money. And so when you average it all together, it makes it look higher than it actually is. But to give you some very, very basic numbers, I pulled this off of the Actors' Equity website today. If you are in Actors' Equity and you're working at a small professional theater um, of around 100 seats, then the minimum that you would make, the minimum a theater can legally offer you if you're in Actors' Equity, would be $215 a week, um, which is not enough to live on, in point of fact. Um, that would only be if you were working on that regularly every 52 weeks of the year. Because, of course, you typically don't work for 52 weeks of the year as an actor, because you do one show that's six to eight weeks, maybe that's 12 weeks, then you have to audition for the next thing, which, you, which may not be coming. But if you're only getting that very, very minimum, that's only $11,000 a year, a little bit more, which is not ideal. Um, the next tier up as Actors' Equity, working in a small professional theater, um, the minimum would be $626 a week, which would be about $32,000 a year. Still, I mean, it's enough to survive on, but probably not particularly well. Let's say you're working at a larger theater, however. Um, if you are a mid-size theater, like one of these Lort houses, then the numbers go up considerably. Um, then the minimum is anywhere between $590 a week to $1,056 a week. Plus, if you're from out of town, you get a certain amount, what they call a per diem. There's a certain amount per day for your living expenses because you're out of town. And that's usually a $50 per diem that they give you to pay for your, you know, your food and that sort of thing. And they typically will, will, will take care of your lodging if you're out of town. If you're, on, if you're in a Broadway show and it goes on tour, then you're beginning to make something more like an actual livable salary, uh, about $1,800, $1,807 specifically a week um, for every week that you're on tour. Um, and that adds up to a bit. But the problem, of course, there is that, OK, so I do a tour. I'm making a little under $2,000 a week for 10 weeks. That's great. That's lovely. But then if I don't get cast in another show for the next 40 weeks, that's a big problem. So it is entirely possible. And, and those, again, I would point out are minimums. Um, people often say, well, what's the maximum? There is no maximum. The maximum is however much the producer thinks that you're worth. There are stars on Broadway, uh, Matthew Broderick in the run of producers, for example, who was able to command about $100,000 a week. That's nice. I would like that. But you cannot count on that sort of salary. Um, that those are the outliers that skew everything. So typically, it is possible um, to make a living wage, but that's why most people who are professional actors also do screen work. because. Film work pays much, much better than, um, than stage work does. Uh, there was an ongoing joke that the reason law and order existed was to give good paying jobs to brilliant Broadway actors who otherwise would have to do cat food commercials. 
Um, so if you watch um, Law and Order, you will often see some of the very best Broadway actors in little teeny bit parts um, on that. Marion Seldes, who is, I think, one of the best actresses alive, and Cherry Jones and that sort of thing. Um, really first class, Tony Award winning people would be playing these small parts on um, Law and Order because you could film them in two to three days. You could be doing a play at the same time and those two to three days would make you more money than the entire Broadway run of a play might make you um, because it pays vastly, vastly better. So anyway, so that is the structure of different theaters. Um, and a basic sort of overview of actors' equity and that kind of thing. What questions can I answer? Sierra, you have a question a moment. Okay. Um, how do you know when, like, it's a toy show or whatever? Um, this is a very, very good question. Typically, it's where you are, what theater. If you're at DPAC, it's a touring show because they don't produce. If you're at Memorial Auditorium, now this is where it gets tricky. Memorial Auditorium both is a touring house. But there's also a producing theater called North Carolina Theater. And they produce their own stuff, but they do their stuff in Memorial Auditorium. So it's very hard to tell with them, is, if you go to Memorial, is this a touring show or is this an original show? And North Carolina Theater has actually made it harder because they've they're so what they call co-producing shows that are touring shows. So they will both produce things here, but they will also do things under their name that are actually tours from New York. And it's very hard to keep track. Um, in fact, there was an article in the paper talking about exactly that. Um, so um, you can look at the program, and typically it will, it will list who the producer is in the program. You can also, if you're familiar with the Broadway production, if it looks like the Broadway production, it's a tour. If it looks different in some way, if the design is different, that's going to be an original production. But it's, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to tell. I mean, it is with DPAC. DPAC anything you see at DPAC is a tour, because that's all they do. Memorial Auditorium, eh, it could be something. That particular production of Les Mis that you saw was a local production. Um, I know because I know the Fontaine from that production. Um, and she's, and she's a Broadway actress. She's worked on Broadway tons. Um, but she's from down here in Raleigh. And so she came back, and her daughter actually played Little Cosette. Um, and so they, they did that here. Um, but it can sometimes be tricky to tell, absolutely. Um, other questions and things? Nikki. Um, you know how you said they're going to be running the show in Broadway and there's going to be a tour? So the actors who did the first showing of that play, would they be the ones that stay in New York and keep doing it, or would they be the ones? Usually what happens is that if you are sort of a supporting character in the Broadway production, when the first tour goes out, you may be asked to step in as a lead character on the first tour. And then oftentimes each tour spawns the next tour. So if you were a supporting character on the first tour, you might be asked to step in as a lead character on the second tour, if a second tour is decided that that would make money to go to different places. So typically, that's the way that you work yourself up. And then what's great is, so if I was a supporting character on Broadway and I got to do a lead character on the tour, then when I go back to Broadway, that's on my resume now. I've got some proof that I can do a lead character. So it's a great way of working your way up um, through there. Yeah? How does that theater, like Raleigh Little Theater, or whichever one has like a really big, how do they get such a big budget? Excellent. So this is a brilliant question. So how does a community theater that doesn't pay actors get this huge budget? Well, one thing, they still charge for tickets. But ticket prices, this is something that, I, I, that is so vastly important. Ticket prices for most theaters represent a very, very small cost of the overall expense of a show. Um, <clears throat> the only exception are Broadway houses. On a Broadway house, um, which are for profit, then those tickets can be anywhere from $50 to $250. Um, for another theater, these are all what are called nonprofits, which means that any, it's not that they can't make money, but all the money they make goes back into making more theater. And nonprofits are supported often by grants from things called arts councils. There exists in this area. A, a arts council called United Arts, which supports all the theaters and other arts organizations in Wake County, plus the North Carolina Arts Council, 
plus there's the Raleigh, the City of Raleigh Arts Commission. And so those places give grants to these theaters to help them make theater. Um, so that's a large part of where uh, some place like uh, Raleigh Little Theater gets their money, is they apply for those support grants. <clears throat> um, and what's interesting is that they have a very interesting position in that 75 years ago when they were founded, the city of Raleigh built them a really beautiful theater and just gave it to them. And the major expense for pretty much all theaters is their building. So the fact that they have their own building, they've been able to save up tens of millions of dollars each year from grants and ticket fees, so they now have an operating budget of a, of a million dollars because they have their own space. It were, and, and they do some really great stuff with that million dollars. Um, but very good question. Um, other questions? Elena, you had a question a moment ago. Oh, no, it was the same one that you asked. Excellent. Chairman. Uh, two questions, actually. How does one join the Screen Actors Guild slash ah. actors, actors' Equity? That, that is the great puzzle. Um, because you get into equity by being offered an equity contract. But technically, you're only offered an equity contract if you're a member of equity. It's what we call a catch-22. So there are ways around that. If a producer has an equity contract, and they really want you, it's like, I'm producing a show. It's going to be an all-equity show, because that's what my, my contract really allows. And I really want Nikki. I think she is the perfect person for that. I may give her an equity contract. And as soon as she, she signs that, she is a member of Actors' Equity. Um, <clears throat> but that, and that is the people I've known who've gotten into equity, that typically is the way that it happens for them. There are other ways through. There used to be a way where you could test in, you could take a test, um, and it basically show that you knew how the business works, you knew about theater, and that could get you in. They don't do the test anymore. Um, there is a system, I'm pretty sure it's still in place, where you can earn points. If you're, if you're doing a show that has a number of equity actors in it, um, and it's for a professional company, they can give you points. And if you earn a certain number of points, then you can get into actors' equity. Uh, they're called eligibility points. I'm pretty sure that system is still, uh, still in place. But it's one of those things where <clears throat> I was initially very concerned um, about when I was really focused on being an actress, like, how am I going to get in? I don't, I don't understand how to get into equity. I'll never get into equity. But, and all of my, my friends who were more uh, seasoned actors said, don't worry. When you're ready, the opportunity will present itself. And I thought, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not a plan. Um, but it's true. It turns out to be true. If you've done enough experience to be ready to be in equity, then typically that, you know, that equity contract um, or that number of points does show up. It, it, it tends to work out that way. The trick is, is, is being in equity always the right thing to do? Um, the people I know here in North Carolina, because there are relatively few theaters that have a large number of equity contracts available, have found it more advantageous to them to not be in equity, because it means that they can do more shows. Because um, if you're in equity, you cannot do a show that is not an equity show. If you are a member of the union and someone says, we'd, we'd love for you to be in our show and to sing the part of Annie. Would you like to do that? You, you'd have to say, no, I'm in the union. Unless you're giving me a union contract and paying me this minimum, I legally cannot be in that show. Um, and so the friends of mine who were in equity in New York who have come down to, to North Carolina or in Utah or that sort of thing typically drop their equity memberships because they find it easier to get more jobs. And those jobs may not pay as well but they're getting many more of them than by staying in actors' equity. There are exceptions. Um, I do know a handful of people who are good enough and photogenic enough that they've been able to stay in actors' equity, um, having moved down here. And they do a lot of commercial work. And again, commercial work pays money, and that makes it well worth it to, to do that. Um, and the same thing with Screen Actors Guild. Oftentimes, if you're, if you're filming, um, now, this is not necessarily true in North Carolina. North Carolina is what's called a right-to-work state, which means that I can make a big-budget Hollywood-type film, say, out in Wilmington um, or in Greensboro, and I don't necessarily have to hire members of the Screen Actors Guild. I could hire other people, which means that it's often cheaper to make films in North Carolina. Um, 
but it also means that you can do a film and you're not necessarily going to be offered a Screen Actors Guild contract as you might if you were involved in filming and you were a featured role, say, out in, in Hollywood or something along those lines. And your second question. Um, it goes back to something you uh, said earlier. How easy is it to drop slash pick up that equity contract? Um, it is relatively easy to drop. Picking up is a little bit harder because here's the thing. To be an actor's equity, you have to pay your dues which are between one and two thousand dollars a year, um, which is that's a lot of money. Um, so getting back in, and there, there sometimes there are additional hurdles you have to jump um, to get back in once you've dropped your membership. To drop your membership, all you have to say is, "I'm not going to be in Actors Equity anymore." Send them an email and not pay your dues, and they will they will very happily take your name off those rolls. Yes. Are there small time producers? Um, yes, yes, um, film and theater as well. And there, there are many sort of theater companies in this area that are even sort of smaller than this. And they may be what we call professional or semi-professional. That is to say that they may pay a little bit um, uh, or they may give you like, like really nice food but not actually a paycheck. And we might call them semi-professional. Because um, actors are always hungry, right? Um, and there's lots of small producing organizations like that here in uh, the Triangle area um, of, of various different sizes. But yes, there are tons of there are many sm more small producers than there are these bigger ones. These are the major sort of institutional ones that have their own space and therefore are you know not likely to change anytime soon. Yes. So how is it in like? LA, like is it more of just the movie theaters, there's not really? There is not a real theater scene in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is about making movies, which is why I hate that place. Um, there is a wonderful theater community in San Francisco, um, and there are some great Lort theaters in San Francisco, and some great producing houses. Um, the La Jolla, La Jolla Playhouse, um, south of Los Angeles, I mean, they do some great work. Um, San Diego, there's some great stuff, but Los Angeles itself is a pit. I'm sorry, no, that's wrong. Um, it's primarily film, and I have very little patience for it. Um, you have to go either north or south of Los Angeles to get to any real theater. And then, once you get to San, Di San Diego, has a great theater community, um, and they do uh, the Mark Taper Forum out there. They do some wonderful stuff. Um, any other questioning things. Really good. So hopefully this gives you some background. We're essentially out of time. Um, thank you for, uh, for your attention. I, I, I'm sorry I have thrown so many words at you today, but it's something I get asked about a lot, so I wanted to give you the breakdown on it. Starting tomorrow, you're going to be looking at some theaters and doing some presentations yourselves. Thank you so much. I'll see you then.